So, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to, uh, Ferenc, I'd like to thank you very much. Tomorrow, I'd like to greet you and I'd like to greet everybody uh, attending this conference. Good morning. Um, Rina, I'm very happy that we're going to be uh, addressing this topic together. So let me maybe share my screen with you so as for you to be able to see our slides. Uh, please let me know what you see uh, because uh, sometimes it's not obvious that we see the same thing. Uh, so um, here's the shared screen. Yes, that's it. Do you see, do you see it in pre presentation mode? Yes, yes, yes. No, not yet. Do you, do you see the presentation mode or do you see the... Not the presentation mode yet. Okay, you see the presentation mode then. Not you see the that. slides. Exactly, very well. So, let me start. Okay. First, we decided to give you an author's perspective and you'll understand the importance of this. It's actually very important to us to talk to you a little bit about ourselves. I'm going to be brief. It's all written on the slide, but the important part is that I want, want you to understand that uh, although I was born in the Ivory Coast, Côte d'Ivoire in West Africa, uh, my parents came from two different religions. Father is a Catholic, mother is a Muslim. Um, I was partially raised in the United States and in my home country because my father was a, a diplomat, was because he's retired today. And then my school years, I spent them in my home country, but then I traveled to France afterwards for my graduate studies, then to South Africa in Cape Town, then to Switzerland, where I did my master's and PhD. And then I took a job in the private sector. I worked as an executive in the area of diversity and inclusion for a company called Novartis. It's a pharmaceutical company. And it is after that that I came to work uh, at university as a postdoc working towards habilitation in the area of sociology. So that's for me. That's a way of introducing myself. But it's not just an, an introduction. There's a reason behind this. So I'll move, I'll give the word to Rina. Thanks, Avi. Um, thanks, Ferenc and Tamara. We're really excited to be here today. Um, so just to give also my author's perspective, uh, similar to Henri, um, something we wanted to share also in our, in our perspective is that we're both of the global north and the global south in terms of our backgrounds, our upbringing, our education. Um, so I myself was born in Mumbai, India, to a South Indian father um, who was Hindu and Telugu speaking, and a Filipino mother um, who was Roman Catholic and Ilocano speaking. So similar to Henri, I was exposed to different religions um, in my family home. Um, due to my parents' professions, we were raised in an international agricultural community in Ibadan, Nigeria, um, and, but always returned to my parents' homelands uh, each year for holidays. We then migrated from Nigeria to Vancouver, British Columbia in Canada um, to a very diverse neighborhood, um, diverse in so many ways. Um, and later on, I continued to attend elementary high school and my bachelor's degree in political science in Canada. Uh, similar to Henri, um, my master's, PhD, and postdoc um, were all in Europe, so in the Netherlands and then in Switzerland. Um, and what's important for me is that I also always worked alongside my um, higher education um, as a peace building practitioner and in NGOs. Currently, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Innsbruck, the Peace and Conflict Studies unit um, here in Austria. Now, you might be wondering, why are we sharing such personal details of who we are in this academic setting? And this is because we see diversity and inclusion not just as a topic of research, um, not just as a theory, but as a lived experience that both of us have been exposed to um, throughout our lives. Um, but that all of us have lived experiences. And depending on one's exposure or non-exposure through one's education and work environments, this can shape and influence our access to certain academic opportunities, our ability to explore particular research areas, as well as our level of engagement in our institutions. Um, so, so we really see the personal in this sense being political, uh, but also the personal being very relevant in terms of how we explore this topic of diversity and inclusion through our perspectives. 
I'm sorry to interrupt. I would really love you to know that the, the way the slides are projected, I don't think you understood um, what Uchi tried to say, uh, um, Dr. Arato, uh, that it's still not the slideshow mode. So we only can see the smaller um, screen with the screen showing the next slide and also all the slides at the bottom. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Sorry for the interruption. I just wanted to make sure that we have Appreciate the best it. experience. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. So um, let me continue because I think what Rina just said tied in very well uh, with uh, a discussion of what diversity and inclusion is, because we gave you a sense that in order, we believe that it's inseparable from a personal dimension. Um, but if we look at the kinds of definitions uh, that are attributed to the concept of DNI, first and foremost, it is uh, something, a concept that has found its way into boardrooms and corporate venues all over the world. Um, and when we look at the definitions that we come across, the definitions tend to operate along the lines of defining each of the terms. So the diversity will be defined and then inclusion is going to be defined. It's going to be articulated to diversity in order to show that these two concepts are tied together in a way that is inseparable. But what we've noticed about these definitions, I mean, we're not going to throw all these definitions at you uh, in this instance, but what we want to discuss with you maybe is the fact that those definitions tend to make the implicit ass assumption that attaining the goals assigned to DNI rests on individual commitment. Um, and and uh, this is something that we would want to challenge because we think that this assumption reinforces a tendency to decontextualize and to decouple diversity and inclusion from the historical reasons for its emergence in the first place. And we're going to explain what we mean by this. So what are some of the most significant political traditions that have enabled the emergence of such a practice in the first place is a question that we asked ourselves. And by way of an answer, we came up with a few ideas. Uh, the first one being that of decolonization. Decolonization, and I'm going to take the perspective of the uh, US American historian, Frederick Cooper, who makes the point that decolonization, he studied West Africa in particular, is um, often understood as the end of colonialism, but if you look at how it actually came about, you understand that it was a reclamation of citizenship rights. So the decolonization uh, that took place in West Africa was brought forward not just by those politicians who went and made claims for national sovereignty, but it was particularly put forward by the workers who went on strike to ask for their rights as workers to be not just respected, but to be actually instituted as such, to ask for family benefits, to ask for better work conditions, to ask for equality of pay. And it is in those uh, instances that decolonization actually manifested itself as a reclamation of citizenship rights. Another instance in which uh, 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 DNI has, as far as we're concerned, historical roots is the civil rights struggles. And I say struggles because I include in this the civil rights movement in the United States, but I also include in this the women's liberation movement, which was not just a US American reality, but was an international reality, uh, and the queer struggles. And uh, these we perceive as an extension of citizenship rights within formally constituted democracies. So uh, in the countries where these struggles took place, on paper, everybody had access to the same rights, but in reality, effectively, these rights were curtailed. And so uh, uh, sections of the citizenry had to fight, had to battle to assert those rights and to extend the realm of citizenship rights. So these are two of the uh, uh, um, historical origins that we see to DNI, but that, those are just two practices. Uh, uh, Rina will add some more to what I've just said. Thanks, Avi. Just as a side note to the host, I'm not sure if you see me when I'm speaking, and if this is a if it's possible to to spotlight me through Zoom. If not, then then don't worry about it. I can it. see you when you are uh, speaking. At least I can. Okay. So okay, for perfect. every other participant, there should be the side panel, and you can choose who you would like to see. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so as Henri already mentioned, um, there are several political tradi traditions which are the roots of DNI. 
Um, another political tradition which is rooted in DNI is critical race theory or CRT, um, which was uh, coined by Crenshaw et al. 1995, a number of legal scholars in the United States who really asserted um, through mostly so social justice activism in universities that racism is not a bygone relic of the past. Instead, it acknowledges that the legacy, uh, the legacy of slavery segregation and the imposition of second class citizenship on black Americans in the case of the US and other people of color continue to permeate the social fabric of this nation. Essentially critical race theory um, asserted five tenets um, that, that the aspect of racism is ordinary and not something aberrational. Um, that the idea of uh, an interest convergence so that uh, essentially people only connected to race if they felt that they also, or racism or anti-racism, if they felt that they could somehow benefit um, from that um, acknowledgement, um, that race was socially constructed um, that there is an idea of um, storytelling and counter storytelling. So whose voice are you really listening to? Um, whose voice are you hearing and whose stories are, are being documented? Um, but also that um, civil rights legislation was very particular in terms of who had access to civil rights and who didn't. Um, so critical race theory emerged very much um, in, in the mid nineties um, as an assertion um, of race as being an important aspect. You could um, go to the next slide, please, Henri. And similar to um, critical race theory, also coined by Crenshaw, um, Kimberly Crenshaw, who is a feminist legal scholar in the United States, um, she connected critical race theory to a very um, specific aspect of feminism, um, an aspect of feminism that goes beyond, let's say, um, a theoretical feminism that all women, um, you know, have the same levels of oppression, um, but instead question the fact that there are intersections um, such as race, class, gender, sexuality, nationality, and ableism, which apply to particular given individuals and groups. So if you are a black woman, um, which Kimberly Crenshaw is, she not only faces racism as a black person, but also um, gender discrimination. So these are intersections that contribute to a particular lived experience um, when you are members of, of a group that receives different types of discrimination. Um, and, and a critical view of how intersectionality has evolved as a term also in academia and in theory um, is also a term similar uh, as we propose like DNI that in some ways has been watered down to include everyone um, and in some ways loses its very specificity about different levels of um, discrimination or, or disadvantage. And uh, <clears throat> I think this, this raises several questions for us, which is how can we collect, connect the political traditions that we just outlined to our understanding and practice of DNI today? To what extent do we need to go beyond the Benetton model uh, of diversity branding toward returning to a commitment to change and challenging social inequalities. And I hand over to Henri, who will speak a little bit about a proposed DNI framework. Thank you, Rina. So, what we mean to say by this is basically we're trying to frame this uh, in a, a sort of series, a series of questions. Uh, is DNI a transformative and emancipatory concept or, or framework? Um, when you connect DNI to these traditions that we've just evoked, and uh, you propose the result, the outcome of these traditions to spaces that claim to use DNI, such as companies, corporations, organizations, you realize that uh, the purposes that you may be pursuing are not always met. I mean, a very basic example of what I'm talking about is equal pay. Equal pay is still not realized. In the best, most progressive companies of the world, uh, equal pay is still not a reality uh, between men and women. To just take that one example, which is a, a very important one as far as we're concerned, to what extent have these different movements and traditions affected our no understanding of knowledge production? And that's where we would like to also take uh, this uh, uh, framework of, of diversity and inclusion. To what extent have we integrated this in the way we actually understand 
uh, knowledge production, our job as researchers and as uh, people that work in the field of, of knowledge, and to what extent do we need to include uh, the concept of equality or equity <laughs> in, the, in diversity and inclusion as such? So this is, this is a potential framework that we're proposing. With these questions, we're trying to address what we see to be areas that have not been actually frontally addressed in the discussion of diversity and inclusion in general. And in order to do that, we thought that we were going to try and address a particular case study to try and illustrate the extent to which this framework can actually operate. And this case study is the case study of the NCCR North-South that Rina is going to present to you in a minute. <laughs> Thank you, Henri. So yes, we have chosen a case study of the NCCR North-South. The NCCR North-South um, was a 12-year program um, that was backed by the Swiss National Science Foundation from 2001 to 2013. Uh, it included 350 researchers based in more than 40 countries worldwide. Um, and it really had a, an emphasis on partnership um, and on creating uh, projects between Global North and Global South. And it emphasized aspects of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity with geographical diversity. Uh, and to go a little bit more into um, what it, it aimed for, um, and this is um, directly from the NCCR North-South documentation, it is to mitigate the syndromes of global change. Um, and, and through those syndromes of global change, uh, I mean, we didn't list it here, but many different issues related to um, natural resources, um, to um, human-driven issues such as migration and conflict, um, to uh, thematic and political issues. And through this, they identified thematic nodes or, or areas of study. Um, and these were divided into three groups, institutions, livelihoods, conflicts, health services planning, and natural resources, economy, and governance. And the reason we choose the NCCR North-South is that actually both Henri and I completed our PhDs in this program. Um, at different times through the University of Basel in Switzerland. Um, and so we are taking the, the case is that we feel that it is a case which explored issues of diversity in some way um, implicitly and in other ways explicitly, um, but we would also like to share a little bit um, about the two projects that we were a part of. So my project um, took place approximately from 2009 till 2014. And it was on private actors and peace promotion. So as I mentioned previously, I'm a, I'm a political scientist and I've been working in the area of peace building um, uh, for many years. And so in this sense, I was part of a, a research project which looked at the role of private sector actors um, in peace and conflict issues. Um, and I put in brackets uh, different types of private sector actors which the different case studies looked at. So whether it's local companies, in our case areas, international consulting firms, national firms, et cetera. And just so that you have a frame of how each project kind of looked like structurally, there was always a global north partner and a global south partner. Um, at the time I was based in Switzerland, um, so I was part of the global north um, research group, um, which was led by the University of Basel and Swiss Peace, a peace building NGO which I worked with. Um, there was a, a, a project leader thus based in Switzerland um, and PhD student, which was myself. Uh, we took case studies um, in El Salvador, South Sudan. That was the project leader's um, focus and myself on Sri Lanka for my PhD. At the same time, at, in the Global South parallel, um, we had a partnership with the University of Kathmandu where the project co-leader uh, was a professor at the University of Kathmandu and a PhD student, a Nepali female PhD student also based there. And they took the cases of Northeast India and Nepal. Um, so just to give kind of an overview of also the, the construct, let's say, of how these thematic nodes in terms of themes, but also how this um, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary work. So, so we were more linked to perhaps social sciences, um, the institutions and in conflict um, node, but there were many other projects um, throughout those many years of the NCCR North South, which, for example, looked at much more natural sciences um, and other areas. Um, Henri will present um, his PhD project as part of the NCCR North South. 
Thank you, Rina. Two minutes. Okay, so I'm going to be very brief on my PhD projects. Um, what is important for you to know is that I'm, I'm trained as an historian, and my PhD project dealt with the notion of citizenship and nationhood in Ivorian history. But besides my work, as Rina indicated, so my work was located between Switzerland and West Africa, uh, uh, the Centre Suisse uh, in Côte d'Ivoire. It's a Swiss research center based in Abidjan. But next to what I was doing, you, I had researchers who were exploring issues of urban sanitation and sustainability, for instance. They were uh, exploring relationships between pastoralists and agriculturalists in Mali in order to understand the political dynamics associated to resource uh, natural resource management and how this influenced the formations of statehood. And so uh, we're trying to highlight this because what we're trying to see, show to you is the extent to which um, people based in the global north and people based in the global south uh, were coming together to work as researchers, but they were coming together and there were so many other unspoken issues that were in the room when the work was being done, precisely because they came from so, so many different spaces from a, from a political perspective, from a cultural perspective, from even an academic practice perspective, uh, uh, the relationships between people who work together and things of that kind were quite different. So let me take you guys to maybe the hypotheses that we put forward in order to explain to you why we think this could be an interesting case to look at from a DNI perspective. So the NCCR North South, the project then, has faced ch challenges whilst attempting to uphold DNR principle in specific areas of its functioning that it had set out to turn uh, to turn upside down. It had specifically said we're doing this because we want to change a certain way of engaging in North-South traditions. And Rina and I are saying we think that this still remained a challenge. And in the areas we're looking at are the power relations within the NCCR between Global North institutions and Global South institutions and how these manifested in the way projects were being thought about and who were put forward as the main authors for papers. Another instance was a compulsory use of the English language in all instances of the NCCR. Now, what you need to understand about the NCCR is that it had partners in South America, Latin America, in French-speaking West Africa, South America, Spanish-speaking, French-speaking West Africa, uh, Nepal, uh, uh, East Africa, where people had so many different linguistic abilities and not just English, but English was still being imposed or the working relationships between supervisors and supervisees in the global north and in the global south, which had a different sets of politics altogether. So what kinds of research questions do we want to put forward attendant to that particular uh, frame? How can the case of the NCCR help us to question the ways in which we can repoliticize diversity and inclusion? To include political struggle in academic institutions and program would be one of them. What is the hierarchy of inclusion? And how can we assess its relevance for the future of DNI? And in what ways do we see that DNI reinforces both visibility on the one hand, yet at the same time reinforces invisibility at the same time? So, in the willingness to show uh, certain types of relationships, we render other types of relationships invisible. And if it is going to be kind enough, I'm going to conclude uh, and say that uh, even though DNI was not specifically named as being part of the NCCR North South philosophy, it was very much about inter and transdisciplinarity, but it wasn't about diversity and inclusion specifically. Our aim is to show how it tried to make DNI principles alive within a higher ed education setting, because it did. Uh, the paradox is that even though the program dealt with the tensions between citizenship rights and access to resources, you still had those types of struggles amongst participants in the program. So although there was a high awareness of the problems as they were being dealt with on the ground, you could find those kinds of problems amongst researchers themselves. So to repoliticize this concept, um, um, it could help uh, 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 modify the ways in which, that's our argument, it could have helped modify the ways in which resources, symbolic and material, were spread. Meaning if we had uh, 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 developed a political awareness around those particular tensions. And our question, our closing question is to know how can other universities and institutions make use of these new ideas internally, as well as on their discourse on society. 
because it is all good and fine to say that we're DNI practitioners, to what extent do we actually uh, 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 live those principles ourselves in our relationship with our students, with our colleagues, with our institutions, and to what extent do these living those relationships reflect on the way we look at society upon which we're trying to produce a critical discourse. And we will end there. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>